On this episode of Law Weekly, we have the views of a recently retired Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Ejembi Eko, on the interference of the executive in judicial appointments, the poor pay of judicial officers, and lots more. Also showing on the program highlights from the 6th ICC African Conference on International Arbitration, which just ended in Lagos, Nigeria, plus a recap of some of the top trending legal stories. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shuyeli. He was born on the 23rd of May 1952 in Benue State and he recently retired from the Supreme Court bench after clocking the mandatory retirement age of 70. I'm talking about Justice Ejembi Eko. After the valedictory court session held in his honor at the Supreme Court on the 23rd of May to mark his exit from the bench, the legal community held another event a few days later to celebrate him, a book launch which also held in Abuja. The book had the title, Honorable Justice Ejembi Eko Dissents. It's a collection and comments on his lordship's dissenting judgment at the Supreme Court of Nigeria, one which attracted family, friends, and many who admired the stance and dignity of the retired jurist. We will see in this book why lawyers and jurists in Nigeria refer to my lord as one, a rebel with a good cause a jurist with positive rebellious erudition. Who is rebelliously positive or positively rebellious, all for the interest of justice. The chairman of the event is a former Life attorney Club general of the Watts, federation, the senior Nigeria advocate of Nigeria, Nigeria Biojo. He and many others spoke about the admirable qualities of the jurist. It is indeed a pleasure for me to be here to preside over the book presentation in honor of a quintessential jurist and remarkable gentleman, Honorable Justice Ejembi Eko. Someone whose private and public life epitomizes outstanding character. I described him as Londini because he was in love with this. He's always dissent, always. I say, yeah, that's our Londini. But he also expresses the mathematical intellect of Lodin in his judgments. One of the most notable dissenting judgments of Justice Echo was in the case of Eitai Ojegede and 10 others against Einek and 30 others, where the bone of contention was the legal implication of the executive governor of Yobe State, Mai Malabuni's act, of presiding over the nomination and sponsorship of Governor Rotimi Akeredolu in the Ondo State Governorship elections of October 10, 2020. The, the majority decision was to the effect that even though the executive governor of Yobe State acted contrary to the constitution, since he was not joined as a party to the suit, the election could not be nullified. But Justice Eko, in his dissenting judgment, upheld the supremacy of the Constitution and was of the view that since the APC had been joined in the suit, it was needless to join the governor of Yobe State, since as a governor he was covered by immunity, as provided in Section 308 of the Constitution. The book, Honorable Justice Ejembi Eko Dissents, is edited by two senior advocates of Nigeria, Ogu James Onoja and Fumi Kwadri with contributions and analyses by 27 other senior advocates. After a brief review, the book is unveiled and formally launched. The celebrant speaks Sokoro about his judgment. Uh, Sokoro wrote the lead in uh, Karufi against uh, APC. But before then, I had submitted my different opinion. After some delays, Okoro changed his mind. Not only just Okoro presided in changing his mind, he also came, it became a unanimous decision. That was a decision followed by Honorable Justice Galumje that produced the Zamfara case. And yes, I've been told here that Session 294 allowed me 
to express my opinion. But I have the natural right of opinion, again guaranteed by Chapter 4, reinforced by Section 294 of the Constitution. So for those of you who are sitting, for those of you who are practicing, when you hold a strong view, express it. You may not know, as a dumb man says, you may not know the arrow that kills the elephant. <laughs> so that's uh, the risk I've been taking. So it appears I've killed some elephants. After the book launch, I sat down with the retired jurist to get his views on some prevailing legal issues. I began by asking him to shed more light on the appointment of chief judges and the role of state governors. Justice Ejembi had said in his valedictory speech that he was a victim in 2006. The constitution vests in NGSC to re make recommendations, interview recommendations for appointment of uh, chief judges of the various uh, jurisdictions. Mind you, we have a unified uh, judiciary, so, so to say. The, but when it comes to... During the military era, it was not politicized. But now, it has been politicized. Uh, what was thought to be a seamless transition. Mind you, the, the way we have adopted under the, our system, unlike America, where the chief executive nominates the head of court, even it may be the lowest. But once, what determines it is his management skills. Here, the, the most senior, I won't, I won't say it's gerontocracy or primogenitorship, but that is what it looks like. So the most senior is usually recommended to, for appointment as a... And the constitution says when the, whenever there is a vacancy, the most senior will act for some time, pending when the substantive uh, appointment is there. So, Invariably, NGSC adds on that uh, seniority, and then when they when they make uh, recommendations, and most chief executives, governors particularly, it, it doesn't happen at the federal judiciary. It happens, uh, this, uh, at the state level, governors say, "No, I can't. This, this person, I cannot. Uh, I want somebody I cannot work with." So, in my own case, I uh, I won't call names. Ah. The Biako is too strict. If you make him chief judge of Benway State, you should forget about winning elections. Am I your chief dog? Not uh, this. Uh, and throughout my life, throughout my tenure as a judge, I never went to government house unless some official, formal location. Every other person is there. I have no business with the governor. I have no business. I live within my salary. So. Because I was, um, I held myself aloof. And I, with a, I say, why should I deliver judgment against government? But there is equality before the law under the constitution. So the government, as a litigant, is equal in law before between me and the litigant. You know, uh, at a point they say, oh, I deliver so many judgments against government. Oh, if you make him a chief judge, you should forget about winning election. Because most of the governors tend to believe that the chief judge is part of their uh, uh, cabinet, cabinet and enlarge the cabinet, kitchen cabinet consultancy. Even me as solicitor general, uh, then I never, I never, I never, I never, uh, never accepted uh, being too political. And so I was expected to be at the airport whenever the governor said, what should I be doing there? I'm an outdoor worker. I stay in the courts. So I never, I never once went to go the airport to receive the governor. So not to talk about the chief judge. So in most cases, the constitution that empowered the NGSC to do that hasn't given enough uh, enforcement powers to the NGSC also. So it's more or less a toothless bulldog. So the court proposes that we think out with that part of the constitution? Yeah, we can, but have they done, done it? The constitution, and mind you, uh, Nigerian constitution is very unique. Unique. Uh, it, it carries a tag of being federal, but are we really federal? It's a unitary system. Since 
He runs it with Decree 1, tinkered with uh, the federal system, and then came with the unitary, the, the coup that uh, ousted the C that brought in Go on. But the, the main reason they gave for housing Ironsi and killing Ironsi was that uh, abrogation of the federation, federalism. But did they, abrog they, did, did they revert us back? They didn't. Their own unitary system is even worse than what uh, Ironsi did. And that was what was proposed to be uh, at the Aburi conference was supposed to be. So if we had adopted the Aburi conference, but incidentally, the the federal government, headed by Gowon, then rejected the Aburi conference. And what we have now, in the pretense of federalism, is actually federalism, it's a completely unitary system. Let's talk about money, and especially the issue of the need for a review of judges' salaries and compensation. Millard raised the pertinent issue and asked the NJC, the Federal Judicial Service Commission, and the Revenue Mobilization, Allocation, and Fiscal Commission to synergize and introspect and tell the world why since 2007 there has been a dereliction of duty on their part to review the salaries of judges. While we hope that they take up this challenge, can Milo tell us in practical terms what has been the implication of this on the judges? It means that the inflation trends since today, they are not in, uh, at pace with the inflation trends since 2000 and they have been reviewing other sectors. Since 2007. And seven. And Section 84 of the Constitution, completely, they are the people to propose the, the review. So why I say NJC, uh, because NJC by paragraph 21E of the third or fourth schedule to the Constitution, is the one saddled with payment or salaries of the this. Why won't NJC now say, oh, you haven't reviewed this judge, this year? And we've been holding all judges' conference resolutions upon communiques and communiques. Yet nothing has been done. So, and the executive, they keep on reviewing salaries, they keep on uh, this thing. The legislature, they are on their own. NGSC should, because the constitution vests in NGSC the responsibility of paying remuneration and salaries, plus one to section 84 of the constitution. So they should have said, okay, these people have not been there. Uh, you have not reviewed the salaries and the this. Milord also touched on the budgetary allocation of judicial officers and made a call for investigative agencies to open the books of the judiciary and expose corruption in the mismanagement of the judiciary's budgetary resources. But are you saying that the judiciary does not have a problem of underfunding, but one of mismanagement of funds? In fairness to Buhari, since he came to power, he has he has upgraded. It has increased the, the budget reduction of the area. And yet, the problem still continues. And the judges are still complaining. That most of them don't even know how much was budgeted. And because of our own discipline, otherwise, should one now go to freedom of information to insist on and demand such things? But we are so disciplined that we keep quiet when uh, this is. So what have, if we are talking about... The, the basic infrastructure, the basic amenities that should make it. We are talking about electronic uh, something. What are the, the facilities there? Have they bought in uh, the facilities for everybody to be uh, compli comp compliant? Have they, have, have they bought have, uh, laptops and computers for every judge? That is, that, that is part of either capital or recurrent budget. The, the, on on uh, this thing, secure the Wi Fi. I know that these things. These are all the things that make the. Are they there? The, 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 the management is ability to make optimal use of the little you have. While administration is, you sustain the continuity. I think they are not managing their resources well. The debate over the quality of people on the bench and the mode of appointment, that debate has been on for a long time now. Does Milord support a reform of the whole process? I think so. It has to be reformed so that we go, go for the best and not just because of some mundane considerations. What do we need to put in place to achieve that we... You have to check the integrity, you have to check the intellectual ability. It has to have the intellectual warehouse. Apart from the intellectual warehouse, it has to be very knowledgeable in law. Those are the things that make a judge. 
And even in the days of Moses, those were the qualities that they make a, make a judge. So a judge, you can't, the society cannot demand less. It has to be one of the best. During your time on the bench, was there ever a conflict of interest? I mean, we know that politicians would always test their limits. Was there ever a time that um, there was a conflict of interest and how did Milord handle it in the way that Milord did his job and somebody if, suggesting? If for any reason that there was a conflict of, I have a duty to disclose. Either disclose to the, the two parties or recuse myself completely. Situations like that did come up. It's, 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 normal. it's normal. It's normal. So when you, when for instance, you find that maybe what you have, uh, you have, there may be a conflict of interest. You have a duty to tell the other side, and then see they are this. Uh, they have had occasions to say, okay, I've been on this. I've been on this. What do you say?